we need to trace back to uh, the other commission, uh, what we call a Salam na Yerk Afalalagi Commission, or Commission for Peace and Reconciliation. And yeah. that was yeah, it uh, was formed uh, yeah. in, uh, in 2019. Exactly. And it was uh, headed by Cardinal Rahana Jesus and uh, that of Vietnam. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. But it was not successful. Yes. Firm to do so. Yeah, we don't see them and we don't hear from them for long. Mm. You see, the point is, and we need to be clear about the difference between these two. So the commission uh, established in 2000. 19 and we need to know what were the successes and what were you know the problems associated with the practice of that commission because we need to take some lesson and i think the establishment of that uh, reconciliation was interesting it was timely and it was very early which is interesting but i think that has failed in one way or the other because we are in a serious crisis situation. The attempt was to prevent conflict and war. So I, by default, I think I can say that is simply a failure. What I, I think the government might have done some assessment on that, perhaps not communicated to the public. But what was wrong with them? And what's the difference between these two? And the first one, I think, when you read the proclamation, it's entirely uh, more often, you know, human rights abuses. And that was actually before the war, and there were different displacements, human rights abuses prior to the change or the reform. And they were supposed to deal with that, I guess. But it's all about reconciliation and building truth and trust and for the sake of justice and peace. But we don't exactly know the whole process and what happened to them. And 40 of them, they were government appointees and uh, they were not active in the communities and you know the whole process of negotiation and trying to solve you know different problems but i think it is a good lesson uh, or the government has to take lesson from the previous commission to craft this one and the focus of this one is entirely all about you know building a common ground a common ground and an attempt to build trust and uh, to dialogue about you know uh, the unresolved political uh, frictions and narratives that we have in this country i really appreciate the establishment of this uh, any situation or this commission because so far you know we've been treating the symptom not the particular disease mm. in this country uh, during you know the changes that we have experienced so far, I can give you two episodes. The first one is when the um, <clears throat> the Haile Selassie regime was uh, you know down and uh, when the dark took power, so that was the first breaking and making of Ethiopia. So the previous narratives of the country this were broken, and then the dark tried to you know build a new path to the socialist Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And the same was repeated during the um, downfall of the drug. And that's the second episode. It's all about breaking and making of this country. So Ethiopia became ethnic nationalist country. Mm -hmm. So in the whole process, the Ethiopian history and the Ethiopian situation is all about the making and the breaking. Mm -hmm. So there is no continuity mm -hmm. in nation building process. So and at the same time, if you look at the political frictions that we have, or the narratives in this country, is all about you see, Ethiopia as a nation, and Ethiopia as you know, a nations and nationalities, or Preston like that. And the third is having, you know, arguing that Ethiopia, we have, you know, uh, <coughs> colonial relations. Mm -hmm. We have a colonial rela relationship, kind of. You know, so there are three unresolved political ideologies in this country. Mm -hmm. So. It is quite important if we have a dialogue, a national dialogue, as a process, and which should take time and should be very inclusive, involving you know, people from different. So 
you know, the, we should not confuse two things. I think these days when you listen to people talking about the National Dialogue Commission, people talk about the reconciliation only. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's about a reconciliation between the, you know, the rebel and uh, the leader of the country. Mm -hmm. For me, as far as my understanding is concerned and, uh, you know, reading the document, it's all about, you know, involving the public and attempt to go beyond the elites to involve inclusively all people, all groups, to engage themselves in talking about what is our problem and how can we forge this country and how can we trace uh, the, the, you know, look at the back and, you know, try to go forward politically, socially, and in any dimension of the country. But it's very difficult for the government to detach the public mm. in the uh, Tigra regional state because they are closely attached to TPLF. And mm -hmm. we don't really criticize the government for not doing that because he, I mean, the government tried a lot even priorly the government coined and uh, launched a reconciliation commission as i have said earlier on uh, which mm. was headed by uh, cardinal brahana yesus and that of yeah. uh, deputy commissioner yetna burst mm. right it was very tough time actually to, mm -hmm. to 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 have a public dialogue with tigrians mm. what is your comment on yeah that? You see, the problem is first we need to, you know, ask the whole process, the whole endeavors mm -hmm. of that commission. It's not about separating a political party from the public. Mm -hmm. When we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about, you know, dialogue, mm -hmm. it has different dimensions. Mm -hmm. And it has, you know, involves a number of agenda. So it's all setting the agenda. So I think the work or the job of the previous commission should be, you know, assessed and should be evaluated and reported. Uh, what were wrong? What was the problem mm. to deal with uh, Tigrayans mm. and to deal with TPLF? Mm. And how did they fail? Because we don't need to, uh, you know, repeat the same problem, the mm. same approach. So, the, you know, that should inform this commission. And when we talk about, you see, um, peace and reconciliation in the context of public, uh, this dialogue, the public dialogue, mm. I think the issue may be serious. The issue of Tigray and the conflict in Tigray could be one, but most significant as compared to the others. But I think we have a lot of disagreements here mm. at the center of the city, mm. everywhere. Mm. We don't know each other very well. Mm. In a saying that, mm. you see, there are different narratives about this country. Mm. And those narratives should be clearly channeled. Mm. And we need to understand, we need to know the perspective or the narrative of the other mm. to sympathize mm. and at the same time to deal with mm. in the course of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So the problem that we raise about Tigray and TPLF is mm. one. And it is a manifestation of the whole thing. Mm. So that's actually something visible on the ground. Mm. But we have lots of issues to solve because we are always and we have been in a vicious circle of conflicts. And that pops up when the issues underlining or the issues with the deep structure of the society should be clearly addressed and you know, brought to the table for discussion. And because, like I said to you before, you know, sometimes I feel that we don't know each other very well. Mm. Because as a multilingual, a multicultural country, most people do not know the language of the other. And, you know, language hides more than it tells. And uh, there are a number of issues that could be raised to the diverse community so that people themselves, people to people, can discuss. Sometimes it's quite important to go beyond the elite. Mm -hmm. Because elites, the elite is all often, you know, part of the problem, at the same time part of the situation, we know. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's quite, you know, important to engage the public. So I, I appreciate if the government takes this, uh, you know, initiative in a sense that it involves the public. And if the dialogue is a mangle between the public. Okay.
Let, let's talk mm. about the way out of reconciliation. Mm. What are the strategies of building peace through reconciliation? Well, there is no one, uh, f one and one orthodox. <laughs> yes, there is no out. one shot yeah. that you can think about this just, because just every conflict, the major, yeah, I'm major confident. strategies. Yeah. You see, there is no one way out mm -hmm. because every conflict is unique by itself. Exactly. Every conflict is unique mm -hmm. and very dynamic. Mm -hmm. But it is important to be clear about some questions in, uh, before the deal. Mm -hmm. The first thing is we need to be clear about the depth and the width, mm -hmm. the magnitude mm -hmm. of the crisis mm -hmm. uh, because we are dealing with crises. Situation. And the type of the conflict as exactly. well. Exactly. This one is a political conflict, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's not a kind of like, um, it's a, a kind of ethnicity or it's a kind of uh, culture based or differences on that uh, mm -hmm. arena. It's a political disagreement. So that you can, uh, you can tell me based mm. upon yeah. the Look, universal uh, principles yes, of reconciliation during yeah. political war. Yeah. Mm. You see, in the first place, uh, it's important to identify the, cl the cause. Mm -hmm. You saw, tr like I said to you before, treating, treating the sympathem is not enough unless you, you know, deal with the, uh, the disease. So most of the time, you know, we don't get, we don't easily get the, res the cause. So the first thing is identifying the cause. That's very much important. And to be clear about, because some of the w activities, some of the uh, conflicts are simply manifestations. So we need to go deep into identifying the causes. The second is um, we need to be clear about the victim. Because the victim is often at the center of the reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. And we need to involve the victim in the process of reconciliation. And the victim has to be validator of the whole process at the end. So mostly, uh, most of you know the reconciliation processes fail because of you know, the principle of forgetting and forgiving. Mm -hmm. You can't forget everything. Mm -hmm. You can't forgive everything. Mm -hmm. So involving the victim is very much important mm -hmm. and, you know, validating the whole process. Mm -hmm. So involving the victim is at the center, like I said before. And the other interesting is about apologia. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about mercy, it's all about apology. Mm. But in the process, mm. who is to apologize? Mm. And to what extent? And how do you apologize? Mm. You see, most of the time, you know, mass apology is exercised. Uh, and a very good example is our government during the reform the early stage of the reform, mm -hmm. apologize to all mm -hmm. those involved, mm -hmm. but there is no responsibility and accountability. Mm -hmm. If there is no responsibility and accountability on the part of the group mm -hmm. apologized, mm -hmm. it's not working. It doesn't work. Nonsense. It's nonsense. Mm -hmm. So there it must be clear about who did what. Mm -hmm. And that there must be confession. And the group or the person has to confess mm. and demand mm. apology mm. and can't be apologized. Mm. So I think the experience of Colombia would help us to better explain this. I will we'll, come to we'll that, come I'll come to to that, that later. later. Yeah. But the other interesting thing is about the shy away, you know, it's about don't tell and don't ask. Yeah. That's the, you know, the problem we have in most of the reconciliation processes. Mm -hmm. I think you know about in the uh, US Army, that is what they call don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> That's about the, you know, when mm. they're addressing gay issues. Mm. So 
in the, when you come to the reconciliation process in Ethiopia, that appears in a different way. Let me mm -hmm. tell you this. Mm -hmm. If there is a conflict between a uh, husband and a wife, and um, the Shema Aguilis would sit and uh, ask what was the cause. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, some topics are, can, are not, Discussed. they're not, you know, disclosed. They, they're not open yeah. for that. So it's all about don't tell, don't ask. Mm. That approach is not appropriate in the reconciliation process. Exactly. When we come to the public dialogue, to the dialogue in, in, the, in the making, I think it's quite important to avoid don't ask, don't tell. Mm. Because that's a very significant one in identifying the clear cause. Mm. The other central point in these uh, strategies is about dealing with silence. Mm. How do you, you deal with silence? Mm. You know, in some culture, silence is like, uh, mm, you know, respect. Mm. In some others, it could mean you have not worked hard to uncover what is hidden in the, in the heart and mind of the people or they are dissatisfied. So you need to be clear about why some people, some group, keep quiet. Uh, you've raised a mm. certain phrase uh, before a while, uh, forget and forgive, right? Mm. Mm. It's a wonderful quotation, sense of forgiveness, I know it. Yeah, that's uh, what I said. Does that work out? Like, how uh, dare you yes. forget your traumas uh. and your economic destruction and your all losses, your existential traits yeah. that happen to your your children, your mm -hmm. wife, the rapes, resource vandalizing. How do you accommodate this? Look that. Mm -hmm. That's the problem in most of the reconciliation processes. Mm -hmm. People, uh, those reconciling and uh, facilitating, they focus on forgetting and forgiving. Mm -hmm. At the expense of what? Peace. Mm -hmm. At the expense of what? Justice. Mm. So that does not work in most of the cases. So it is important mm. to involve mm. the victim mm. and you know, compensate the victim mm. so that the victim can validate the whole process. So simply if you tell someone to tell, to forget, it doesn't work. By telling them okay, to forget. Uh, what are the items um, granted for those victims as a compensation zone? Okay, compensations of different uh, types and uh, could be monitoring, it could be non-monitoring, it could be cultural, it could be political, it depends upon the cause. Who ought to be the moderator? Dialogue demanded among the public mm. in understanding on coming up with just common ground about it, this country. I think the purpose of this uh, uh, public dialogue or national dialogue, uh, uh, like I read it, it's about preparing a common ground about this country. For the last 40 years, we have capitalized on the differences that we have. We have went, even, we have even True, abused. Wrong uh, we have abused and we didn't work on you know, a common ground. What if you ask somebody, what's Ethiopia, and what is, what is the content of you, that country, and what is the silence of that country? Sometimes you find it difficult too. So it's all about, you know, uh, trying to build a common ground, not necessarily dealing with TPLF and uh, the reconciling. But if we, if we talk about that even, the whole process is who is to, like you asked me, who, who is to facilitate? Usually, people trusted, accepted by both groups. And sometimes, the, you know, if you take, for example, Sierra Leone, they uh, used, you know, the international community as mediator. You know, sometimes people may try to, you know, look out of the territory of the country, but that has its own problems. It has its own uh, issues to talk. So it's all about individuals or groups that those opponents can trust and can be you know, neutral to both of them. Uh, what has to be given priority during national dialogue? Of course, you try to mention yeah. it, but make it specific. 
Yes, the agenda setting is one of the most important issues in uh, national dialogue. In, in the first place, the public should be part and parcel of this. The agenda should be open and the, the public has to, you know, set the agenda. And then, the, you know, the, the commission can uh, prioritize. But most of the problem that we have is we set the agenda, the elite set agenda, and simply communicate that to, to, uh, to the public. That's a serious problem. So if the most important thing is to involve the public in every, in every situation, and at the same time communicate, communicate findings, communicate everything timely. A very good example is the confusion that we have about the commission today. The public has a confusion because it's not well communicated. The government has to clearly communicate the intentions, the process, and, and the activities that commission ahead of others, like in the social media or in other outlets, uh, misinform and disinform the public. Okay, another mm. question. Ethiopian government has released uh, some political prisoners recently, mm. and uh, what is the role of releasing political prisoners in widening the political space and uh, its contribution for the national dialogue as well? I think this is not a new experience for Ethiopia. Mm. Since the reform, mm. I think every prisoner, everyone was released from everywhere. Mm. That's how we are known for, I think, uh, mm. during the reform. Mm. So this doesn't surprise me. This doesn't surprise me. What is I mean, its contribution yeah, to I'm the national to dialogue? I'm coming to mm. that. Mm. Mm. Um, it doesn't surprise me. Releasing, mm. I think mm. the Abe government is known for this very well. Mm. Even you know, bringing prisoners from other countries too. Mm. We are mm. known for that. Those who were in exile. Also. Exactly. Mm. So that's very important because everybody is important in national dialogue, despite even the figure despite the population. S diversity of opinion is at the, cent at the center of uh, public dialogue. So releasing political prisoners recently is a good endeavor. Because every politician prisoner, if you, c you call them political prisoners, they have people behind them. So if you are dealing with them, then you should address all members of the public. So releasing the prisoners of whatever kind is vital in engaging public mm. to public uh, discourse or uh, dialogue. And they are also important. It is, the dialogue is to bring people to the common point. You know, we have politicians, we have people, you know, from, you know, far distance in terms of their ideologies. So uh, the dialogue is very important to bring them into the middle. So as the attempt is to make or uh, you know, to craft a common ground, I think these people are very much important. To, okay. Yeah. Uh, the Ethiopian National Dialogue is an ambitious attempt in, mm. in bringing a long-lasting peace in Ethiopia, right? Mm. And uh, we have uh, this uh, Tunisian national dialogue and Colombian national dialogue and peace and reconciliation mm. regard. Uh, these two countries are good, I mean, good examples mm. when it comes to peace and reconciliation. Mm. Uh, what ought to Ethiopia learn from these two nations in dealing with this national dialogue, though? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually I'm interested with the the Colombian one. Colombian. Uh, Example. I think that must be uh, communicated to the, or taken as uh, a good example for most of the conflict uh, countries in the world in dealing with and resolving conflicts. I think the Colombian war took, that's the longest, I guess, about exactly. 52 years. Yeah. And there was a division among uh, or between ruler and Arwan and the government siding the rural and uh, the rebel siding with the 
the uh, towns and cities. Yeah, mm. it, uh, or the other way, I'm mm. not quite sure. Mm. So, <coughs> so what we learn from them is something different from Northern Ireland, for example, Sierra Leone or any other countries. They have their own unique approach. I mean, the Colombians, they went through a unique approach. So, uh, you know, they didn't go against with the international community and they didn't invite the international community at the same time. Mm. So they didn't have, a, you know, that much uh, relationship with the West mm. and tried to involve uh, in the international community in dealing with their problems. Mm. They engaged themselves. Mm. So the rebel group and the government signed agreement. Mm. So, and the lesson is, so they didn't, you know, they didn't focus all on the peace. They focused on, you know, the justice also. You see, most of the conflict resolution or reconciliation processes, they focus only on the peace and they forget the justice to the victim and participating the victim. You can take the South African case. You can take, you know, you know, most of the cases in Africa. So at the expense of, you know, the justice, they capitalize on the, you know, peace process. So that becomes very fragile. And you can take, you know, the South Sudan case as well. So what is interesting is there is mandatory confession in the Colombian case. Both the government and the rebel. There is the whole process is one central lesson is mandatory confession. So the rape, the mass killings, the genocides that you've been involved, for example, you should confess. And if you confess, you may be imprisoned only from five to eight years and the prison actually in the community service. But if you don't confess, you'll be imprisoned for 20 years, minimum of 20 years. Mm -hmm. So there is what? A kind of balancing the mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. and giving you know, credit to the victim. And taking responsibility. Mm. So you see, there are three things in the whole process. People may deny responsibility or shift responsibility or could accept fully the responsibility of, you know, whatever they committed. Okay. So this, the Colombian case teaches us that uh, those from both the government and the uh, uh, rebel group, they take the responsibility with full responsibility. And the other interesting thing is the main cause of the problem is the rural urban division. And the rural part was not, you know, given well focus in terms of infrastructure. So the government was, uh, you know, kind of given responsibility to invest on agriculture and infrastructure every of the issues they raise about community service and the whole process actually they have taken their own you know their own culture into consideration the caribbean culture uh, then taking that as you know a frame within that frame and everybody taking the responsibility and the apology was very specific and then in the whole process, the victims were involved, the victims were compensated, and the victims were the validators of the whole process. That's what we learned from Columbia. Actually, we do have w our own conflict uh, resolution yeah. methodologies yeah. In, in different um, uh, ethnicity, for instance, in, in Oromo culture, we do have a Baghdad's mm. and Hadassin case. And, mm. uh, in the southern nations they do have their own in amhara yeah. and what ought to be the role of uh, elderly in this national dialogue well you know the problem with ethiopia is for the last 40 years ethiopia 
forgot his own uh, you know leaders, indigenous. indigenous leaders indigenous. because for the last 50 years ethiopia didn't image itself uh, uh, you know the approach was outside looking but, uh, but you need to develop inward looking perspective so the abagadas were forgotten the elders were forgotten for years anyway ethiopia should look back to it is own indigenous way of dealing with conflicts. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you come to the different approach from the lessons that you take from different mm -hmm. uh, groups, a very good, uh, recent example is the Gedeo, Gedeo or mm -hmm. uh, Shemaglis. Yeah, yeah, the, the Gedeo elders. Elders, yeah. So they were significant. They kneeled down. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then the, you know, they fixed the problem. Exactly. So I think we need to go back to ourselves and look at how we can involve, make use of the Shemagilis or the elders mm -hmm. in the whole process. And the Shemagilis are, I think, very popular in uh, a communal country like Ethiopia in uh, dealing with uh, conflicts and uh, peace processes. Okay, appreciate it. And one last question. Uh, what has to be the role of media mm -hmm. in this national dialogue? Because I do have my own doubt some media infringe and ignite exactly conflict than mitigating the conflict itself you, you understand what i'm saying I, yeah, sure. they fuel fire upon the ongoing conflict yeah others tend to their own um, agenda and goal interest ego you see mm -hmm. what ought to be a role of the role of media those mm -hmm. medias which are affiliated to the government and other private media as well because yeah. it's very vital i think i've been giving you know different trainings and uh, workshops on uh, on how to report uh, conflicts and at the same time you know the role of media in reconciliation uh, maybe i have already told you about uh, the first commission uh, mm. i gave them training on this so the media is very much important. And the first thing is we need to clearly identify the media that we have. We have four perspectives of the media, four polarized media in this country, based on the political arrangement. Mm -hmm. So now when we are dealing with the dialogue about the commission, so we are trying to, to deal. So the media should also deal, involve itself in the process and they should report the actual scenario the actual situation instead of interpreting that in their own way because every time you interpret a point it's all about the ideology that you have mm -hmm. so we have four different ideologies in this country so those ideologies are running the media so the owners of the media, they all have their own ideology. So, and we know that there are about four ideologies. So these should not be you know, portrayed, and mm -hmm. they, this should not be facilitated, or this should not guide mm -hmm. misunderstanding and misrepresentation and misinforming. So the point is, everything should be reported straight from the scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, information we get must be to the, communicated to the public, must be through the communication office of this uh, public or dialogue with the national dialogue office i think that's already in making mm. so uh, it's all about you know distancing yourself from uh, interpretations mm. so a good journalist should distance himself or herself from uh, her own interpretation or his own interpretation of the actual conflict situation and uh, dialogue Okay, Dr. Anton Hesagai, uh, intercultural communication expert from Addis Ababa University School of Journalism. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Dear viewers, this brings you the end of our edition for today. Bye-bye. See you next time with another edition. Take care.